Well, the first thing that comes to mind um, is the reason we have a Women's History Month is because women have been historically disenfranchised in many ways. And so this is a recognition of uh, that history and where we are now and things that we can uh, change moving forward. I think in addition to that, I think of a Women's History Month not as something you do to set women apart somehow like more so or better than others, but rather to take time to celebrate all the ways women have overcome a lot of barriers and knowing that their history is one not just of strife or adversity, but resilience and like courage. There's so many things to celebrate. Um, so that's something that setting that apart, I think is a really neat thing to take time to reflect on and to then be um, public about and celebrate together. It's a celebration of women, just specifically all women and not just whether you're a mother or anything like that or a grandmother. So this gives, gives us this opportunity to celebrate who we are, you know, where we are, where we're going, where we've been. So we have the opportunity, like I said, not only just to celebrate ourselves, but our community celebrates us as well. And all of our other environments have the environments have the opportunity to celebrate us as women, as who we are. Women's History Month means um, pride. I am very proud of what women have accomplished um, from a historical perspective, um, and. I think it renews my strength to try and also um, ensure that women continue to have equal rights and equal opportunities, um, but it also is a celebration for me of just history of what has happened in the past and how much we've managed to accomplish. I'm not sure that I can say I have just one role model. Um, I would say I come from a long line of strong women. Um, I would say my mother, my aunt, and my grandmother, who just turned 100 years old, um, all have um, shown uh, grace and tenacity and um, a lot of love and just uh, concern a lot of times in some not so good situations. Um, I also think, which may sound kind of odd, but um, I look at both of my girls as role models and especially role models for women because I think that even though they are my children and it's my job to teach them that they have taught me so much. And um, another role model I think that I would have or I would say someone, I would look at these not necessarily as role models, but someone that has influenced me in my life. And um, I think that that is Dr. Maya Angelou, the late Dr. Maya Angelou. Because I think as a little girl, when women, and especially black women, didn't have a whole lot of voice, um, her books and her attitude and just seeing her speak um, taught me that we could have a voice. And so, um, I think that reading her works were, um, it was a, a turning point for me and understanding that there is adversity and that overcoming adversity was a possibility. Rosa Parks, Tubman, Anita Del Rio, and then there's a fourth one, Dolores Huerta. Dolores Huerta is part of the United Farm Workers and that she was one of the main leaders. I mean, she was married, she had children all along her journeys but she helped with the thing about pesticides not being in the food, in the vegetables and lettuce and stuff like that. I personally got to participate in one of those walks, which was a, a passive walk, but it was a good walk. But it brought attention that obviously, as the people that work taking, picking up the crop, it also affected them, but also us that ate that food. So that was a good journey. It's a good um, experience that I had. Kay Redfield Jameson, which most people probably haven't heard of. Um, she was a clinical psychologist and a writer who had bipolar disorder. Um, she wrote about her mental, writes about her mental health um, condition. And when I was diagnosed with a severe mental health condition, I was very scared about my future. Um, and what that meant for me for a career and things like that. And it was through reading her book and listening to her conversations and talks that I realized 
that I too could have a really successful career with a mental health condition um, and that I could be public about my mental health condition. And so it's through kind of that work with her and reading others as well that I'm able to be very public about my mental health condition and am very involved in mental health initiatives on campus, um, but also in the state of Missouri through the National Alliance on Mental Illness. The people that I keep around me, the people that I, I keep in close contact, the people who are in my inner circle, those are people who I learn stuff from. You know, from this person I learn, um, you know, how to communicate better. From this person I learn how to be more organized. I think I would consider role model as mentor as well. And my, when I was growing up, a sense I always got, whether it was directly communicated or not, was that women could either be womanly or feminine, that was a key word for the generation I grew up with in my parents and grandparents' generation, um, or they could be intellectual, but they couldn't be both. So I think my first mentor that helped me see that women can be, um, you know, who they are as women, whatever that may be, but also intellectual and wanting to pursue academic and intellectual goals as well as things that matter to them personally and things that connected with others' needs. Like all of those things, um, because I think historically, a lot of times women are encouraged to put others' needs before their own needs and interests. Um, so the first time I saw that was with a college professor. I had an English professor who really helped me understand that there was a different way to be a woman and academic. Um, and that really set the stage for a lot of my next steps regarding grad study and the work that I do. But because she was so focused also on serving others, it set the stage for my work in McNair as well in terms of recognizing academic research and academic life and culture overall aren't just about knowledge, but they're also about making the world better and helping others. So that was important, really important for me. Before I became an educator, I, I received my PhD in neuroscience and I loved education. Uh, so I did not go a traditional PhD route. I started working at a nonprofit um, biotech educational outreach program and eventually became in charge of those programs. And I had lots of wonderful opportunities. I served on um, government appointed committees for the state of Connecticut through that. I met presidents of major pharmaceutical companies and I helped raise over $1.2 million for the programs. Um, I ultimately decided to leave that position and start my own bio, um, science education consulting business. And I worked with a lot of partners uh, doing really neat projects, developing curriculum, um, developing different projects, museum displays and things like that on science. Uh, but I had an unusual opportunity come about to serve as director of a molecular cell biology graduate program at a university. I had decided hmm, maybe I'll check out and see what higher education is like. Uh, I really enjoyed that, but I did miss my K-12 education experiences. Um, so I left and taught fourth through eighth grade science, and that was a job that I absolutely loved. I was there until um, we moved to Missouri to come to Truman. As a student, and then a graduate student, and then I started teaching as a graduate student, and then when I was still in graduate school, I started working here at the community college and at Truman, and then I started working at Truman. So <laughs> I was a student before I was an educator in lots of ways. I've been uh, everywhere um, doing lots of different things, but uh, I was a nanny for a while. I went to graduate school. I worked in international adoption and child welfare um, before I found myself here at Truman. I'll work with the McNair program. Well, I believe I've always been an educator, you know, whether it was formal or informal education, but I professionally worked in um, corporate America. So I worked in the banking industry. And so I did that for several years. I also worked for a financial firm as well for a few years too. So pretty much the corporate the corporate 
sector was my area and specialty as well too. So I was wanting to transition over to higher education because that's just been my passion and my heart for educating. Um, even, like I said, informal education, um, with, along with formal education, I think they're one of those areas that they met, they merge and marry together very, very well. And it's just for self-development to become a real, well-rounded individual in person, especially a woman, for us, for our presence to be, you know, no matter where we go, where we show up in our spaces, that we are very well educated, whether it was a formal education or informal education, we have that wisdom that we can carry along with us, no matter where we go. To be persistent, find that resilience that doesn't always feel like it's there, but it is, and you gotta dig it up sometimes and be persistent. I um, wanted to change careers, and I started the path to changing the careers in 2009, so that's a long time. And I, I spent several years studying on my own and preparing myself for the next career, and then I spent five years interviewing and trying to break into this new field that's very difficult to break into, and I you know, that's five years of rejection <laughs> that I'm talking about. Five years of rejection, and of course it hurt, and I would cry, and you know, my husband would say, stop applying, and I'd say, that's dumb. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna stop. Mm -hmm. And I would find that resilience. It wasn't always easy to dig up, but find that resilience to go back to the drawing board, look at my portfolio, what can I add for the next one? What can I, what, what skills, what credentials can I add for the next interview opportunity? And after five years of very consistent interviews, um, I got it. <laughs> Love yourself, be who you are, no matter what, having your own self-confidence, build your own self of your own self-esteem because no one else may do it, but you have to do it for yourself. Celebrate yourself as well, encourage yourself, as often as necessary and just make life about what you want to how you want to show up in the world how you want to show up in other spaces how you want to just show up when you get home at, after a long day's journey learn what your strengths are no matter how different they are from others and work with work from those start with those talk to yourself in getting to know who you are and not just who everyone else expects you or wants you to be because the more you understand and talk to yourself about who you are and what you want then you will be more able to become who you want to be and it doesn't really matter if you become the greatest person or what is considered to be the greatest person on earth if that's not who you want to be and so secondly I would say to be kind to be kind to yourself because you will fall you will make mistakes However, um, don't dwell on those things. Remember who you wanted to be and get up tomorrow and work on being her. I want every woman to realize that they're powerful and that they deserve to be at the table making the decisions. Never stop learning because tomorrow's always something new and set your goals because your goals are what's gonna take you to where you wanna go. And in the process, bring the other women with you the woman that might not know what's happening or has been learning or not learning, they might need a helping hand and they might be your anchor to another anchor. So that's the biggest one. When I was an undergraduate and graduate student, um, there was a lot in the popular media about how women should change themselves um, to become professional, to become successful. Uh, it was the primarily the lean in era um, and I feel like we should challenge that idea because it's very limiting in the sense that we know that the current structure, the idea of who is a successful person or who looks professional is created to limit who has access. So by changing ourselves to try to fit within that model, we're just perpetuating a system that is designed to exclude people. So my advice is really to push back and work to make change that 
demonstrates that you can be successful, you can be a professional uh, regardless of what you look like, your gender, identity, your race, uh, your sexual preference, all of these things shouldn't uh, define who you are. So we need to flip the system, change the structure uh, in a way that will make uh, professional cultures more inclusive. So just working to push back on uh, you know, expectations that don't really fit with how you view the world. Um, that are clearly designed to keep people out.